Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of MD Insight. My name is Connor Delaney. Uh, I'm part of the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute at Cleveland Clinic, and I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Sarah Alawali, who is one of our gastroenterology team who has an interest in IBD. Sarah, welcome. Thanks for being with me. Thank you for having me. It's fantastic. So Sarah, you've got an interest in IBD. What, what drew you to that out of all the fields in GI or anything else in medicine? Right, right. I think that's a great question. And, you know, it's interesting because I actually went into GI to do hepatology. Um, and then I remember my first day of GI fellowship, I was rounding with Dr. Alan Barkey, who became my mentor, and um, I loved endoscopy. And then as uh, the fellowship went, you know, as I got to see more patients with IBD, that's when I realized that, it, it, you know, it's a fascinating field because they can be so affected by that disease. You know, initially, we saw a lot of inpatients with IBD that were very, very sick. Um, but then you see them in the clinic and you see that you're making them better. Um, and um, I thought it was fantastic. So IBD um, can really affect their lives from, you know, all types of aspects. And, you know, psychologically, physically, um, from a nutrition standpoint, I mean, everything. But then the impact we can have when treating them properly is incredible. So I really think that's what drew me to IBD. Um, and then the other thing I think with IBD is we really don't understand the full story yet. We know how, how bad or how, how complicated it can be sometimes, but we don't know why some patients do okay and some patients don't, you know? Um, so it's also fascinating to, um, to be able to, you know, to be in this field and try to contribute a bit more to this. Yeah, it's certainly a rapidly evolving field with technology and drugs and minimally invasive surgery yeah. and looking yeah. after their patients too. I think it's somewhere where we have a huge opportunity to impact quality of life and how patients function. So awesome. the first time I met you was over at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. We're lucky to have an international system, but I met you there. Uh, obviously. Maybe you'd tell us a little bit about how practice in Abu Dhabi is different and, and maybe even different profiles of disease, particularly IBD in, in the Middle East versus here. It was a fantastic experience being in Abu Dhabi. I was there as I was there as an attending for three years. And, um, you know, IBD was almost unheard of in that area of the world a few years ago. And when I arrived, I was seeing some patients with IBD, but um, with the, you know, as the time went, I could see more and more patients with IBD and they were presenting with really complicated disease really early on. Um, and that was really um, interesting because, you know, patients didn't know much about this disease. Doctors in that area didn't know much about this disease either, you know, families either. So uh, it was really challenging, I have to say, to take care of patients with IBD um, in that area of the world. And um, we, we know that, you know, what we tried to do actually is to set up these patient education sessions to try to teach more about IBD and raise awareness. And I think that was really, you know, I think that was the first um, uh, time it was being done in the country. And, and definitely when I go back, I want to continue building on that. Um, but I think it was challenging because they were presenting with complicated disease because they didn't know much about this disease, but nobody really did um, in that area of the world. So I think these were the challenges, and, but it was really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating the way diseases evolve as diets evolve and society evolves and sometimes it's not even clear what the driver is. But so you've come over here for a year now and you've really focused on some, some new areas of IBD and um, maybe you talk a little bit about some of the research you're doing and, and then how you, how you might apply that to our, our kind of international IBD program for right. a clinic. Right. So I think, you know, coming here, one thing that, what, that I had in mind was, and I think we discussed this, is how, why is it that some patients do okay and some patients don't? And what is it that's driving the disease and the severity of disease in some cases? Um, and I remember, so I came here on my first day of clinic with Dr. Uh, Reeder, who's a gastroenterologist here at the Cleveland Clinic and one of the world leaders in IBD and strictures. I was asking him, so why, you know, are we really doing much by treating patients with medical therapy that already have strictures and what are we, you know, what is their natural history? And he said, well, fantastic. Why don't we study it? And so um, 
we've done um, a few projects looking at strictures and specifically how do patients with strictures respond to medical therapy and are we you know you know the problem with strictures is that in patients with strictures is that they've been excluded from a lot of the, the, the trials in IBD and so the reality is we don't really know how they do we have a bit of data but not that much um, how they do with medical therapy and so, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at response to medical therapy. We're also looking at natural history. And so, um, you know, it's remarkable. We don't yet have the results, but what I've, uh, I've come to realize is that some patients really do okay, even with stricturing disease for years, and some don't. And so the, the interesting part is to try to figure out what are the predictors of surgery or, or severe outcomes in those patients. Yeah, absolutely. It's always amazing, isn't it? Somebody who can have terrible disease on imaging and they're actually getting by okay and vice versa so it takes a really in-depth understanding of individual patients to try and decide the right treatment for them right. right yeah so tell me about some of the interesting new thoughts around management of fibrosis and non-surgical management of fibrosis Right. So, you know, there, there's a lot out there. Um, you know, a lot of our patients are presenting with already stricturing disease. And so um, um, medical therapy in terms of biologic therapy, you know, it, this has been looked at in terms of the more conventional biologic therapies like anti-TNFs. But right now what we're looking at is, you know, looking at vidalizumab and ustekinumab that really haven't been studied in this setting. And so that's one of the things we're doing. Um, another thing is Dr. Reeder is working on, and, and I'm very hopeful that he'll find something that helps these patients, but um, he's working a lot on antifibrotics. Um, and I think, you know, if we're able to reverse fibrosis in patients with strictures, that would be a game changer. And his lab is really working very hard on, on trying to find that and trying to understand the mechanism behind fibrosis. You really need to try to understand it better before finding, you know, treatments for it. Um, and um, another thing is, you know, endoscopic dilations and uh, minimally invasive uh, procedures um, to try to, you know, make these patients better. <clears throat> but, you know, Connor, at the end of the day, <clears throat> a lot of them do end up having surgery. And I really think it's important to try to figure out who it is that need, you know, who needs, who needs surgery and not delay the inevitable, you know, um, yet uh, know who can actually be okay with medical therapy and endoscopic dilation. And so I think there's still quite a bit of work to be done in this area. Yeah, you're right. Fear of treatment uh, uh, often puts people off from having something done when they, they should. We're seeing that a lot at the moment with COVID-19, right? Our, our cancer surgeries and many other surgeries dropped for a couple of months because people were scared to come in. But that's been a game changer for you too. You've become a a local expert on COVID-19. What's that been like? Right. Uh, so I've been very lucky to work with Dr. Reguero on COVID-19 um, and the team here. We've had a few webinars. Um, you know, it absolutely was a game changer. Um, and really early on, I'd say, what we realize is that COVID-19 can really affect uh, the, the GI tract and, you know, um, everything related to GI. Um, so COVID-19 um, can really be associated with all these GI symptoms, right? And so diarrhea, vomiting, uh, decreased appetite and all this. Um, and so a lot of our IBD patients were actually presenting with these symptoms. And that was also a concern or a challenge, you know, do they have COVID-19? Is this their IBD flare? Um, is this something else? And so, so what we've come to realize is COVID-19 is affecting the GI tract quite a bit. Uh, leads to symptoms in about 30% of patients. Studies are, you know, you know, show rates from 10 to 60%, but really good studies recently from the US and UK found that it was about 30% of patients that could present with that. And something that's important to realize is, I'd say up to 16% of patients can actually present only with GI symptoms. Um, can you imagine? So that means that these patients feel, you know, you have to have a high degree of suspicion um, and test them properly. Um, but there's a lot we still don't know about COVID-19, especially related to the GI tract. Um, and it's funny because we're talking about COVID-19 now, but who knows what we're going to discover in three to six months. And maybe what we know now may not be true in the next few weeks. Um, but some things we don't know is, so patients get GI symptoms, but do they do worse? 
Um, I think studies are, are, are still not clear on this. Um, some studies show that they do worse, some studies show that they don't. Right. Um, and so, and the other, I think the, the million dollar question is whether there is fecal oral transmission. Um, you know, and we've, we've talked a lot about this, but essentially we do see uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. We see it in the stool. We know it's there, we know it's live. And in fact, some researchers have been able to infect cells, cell lines in the lab from infectious stool. But we still don't know whether um, it actually does lead to fecal oral transmission in, in human beings. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's, it's certainly live, but that doesn't mean it gets transmitted. And it's probably never going to be a high percentage because we would have found out about it before. But it's, it's actually really interesting to be at this stage of rapidly evolving disease with an incredible amount of research being done. It's uh, almost impossible to keep up with the literature in this field alone. Absolutely. It's been a challenge. Yeah. So how do you keep up? Because another big project of yours has been going on for about 16 months now. And uh, tell us more about managing having a young child when you've got about 200 projects going on as, uh, in the rest of your life. It's a great question, Connor. I wish I knew. <laughs> so I think a lot of it is, you know, time management. I think the concept of time is completely different once you have a baby. Um, and so it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge, but it's been fantastic at the same time. Um, I think you just learn to, to you know, keep some you know, hours of the day completely dedicated to the baby. And then you may have to work all night or very late at night. And um, you know, your schedules are all over the place, but I think it just, it's just so satisfying and so rewarding at the same time. It's, it's a very interesting feeling. I feel overwhelmed, but I feel very happy. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. It is. It's, uh, I think, one of the best and most special things we ever get to do as human beings is uh, uh, having kids and, and that whole experience. Right. Well, Sarah, um, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me. Uh, it's a pleasure. And for those of you watching, uh, Dr. Elawali is a an IBD specialist returning soon to Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi and we thank her very much for her time today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.